Hello, and welcome to Denton's Tales. Now, Viking Proof. Well, not a lot of that around in many cases, as far as popular opinion goes. And it's, it's not helped by so many inaccurate TV shows and movies, some of which could hardly be wrong at to coin a word. So much of the popular ideas about the Vikings are either misunderstood, misrepresented, or just plain good old porky pies. So, to Scandinavia over a thousand years ago, and the Vikings, who weren't actually Vikings, even when they were, which may be a bit confusing, but I'll come to that. I'll come to that shortly. One of the most popular misconceptions about Vikings, of course, is the horned helmet, which no Viking ever actually wore. They had helmets well, like those, called the ocular type because of the, the eye, uh, eye holes, and they had helmets like that one over there, which is called the nasal type because of the no thingy down, down the nose. But thanks to the operas of Richard Wagner, it became almost a trademark of the Vikings. First used by costume designers for characters in his opera, but later being drawn on every Germanic, historical, and mythological character, and thus the horned helmet equaled Viking, you know, they becoming famous and instantly recognizable for something they never actually wore, which is a bit ironic, really. Some, some stereotypes, of course, uh, had a, a factual basis. I mean, Scotsmen did wear kilt, Germans did wear lederhosen, and the Irish were inclined to take a drink or two, or even three, maybe four. But, you know, not all of them, all the time. But the horned helmet, it had no basis in actual fact. Likewise, the winged helmet for the Valkyrie, or the, the Valkyries in English, probably wings because the Valkyria could fly, and, you know, they were popped onto foyer as well, which again came from Wagner, and uh, Brynhilde and the Valkyria being shown with wings on her helmet that would have not done credit to an albatross. A horned helmet, you know, would have been, well, it would have been some disadvantages, really. It would be more easily knocked off someone's head, uh, or the horns could be grabbed by an adversary. Or, you know, if one ducked sideways in the shield wall to avoid, say, a spear thrust, well, Olaf standing behind you and might now have one of your horns stuck in his ear, which would be you know, inconvenient, to say the least. Now, as a bit of terminology, to call them Vikings is in itself an inaccuracy. They weren't, despite them being referred to in that way in almost every book, uh, movie, television show, YouTube documentary, and so on. The term used almost as a, as a nationality. You know, the Vikings are often spoken of as if they were an actual nationality. They all came from the same place and were led by some overall ruler, the king of Viking land sort, sort of thing. One would get the impression that the Vikings were like the Normans, the Russians, the Germans, and, and so on, a, a people from a particular country. But of course, they were actually from different countries. They came from Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Friesia, sometimes included, led by a considerable number of Jarls and kings who frequently fought amongst themselves just as often as they fought other people. You know, they were never a, a single united force. Even the, the great heathen army that ravaged England rather successfully in the ninth century, it wasn't a united force by a long way. It had numerous leaders competing with each other. Each one wanted to be the top guy on the totem pole. One of the reasons for its eventual defeat, the warrior the, the factions, they, they never worked as one. You know, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, you could say. Yet the term Viking is applied to the entire population of Scandinavia. You know, everything, everything like art, culture, religion, and, and ships getting the Viking prefix. You know, I mean, there's actually no such thing as a, a, as a Viking ship. You know, I mean, that over there, well, it was just a ship, you know. And uh, some Vikings may have been traveling in it, but the ship, the ship had no Vikingness uh, of itself. The, the people of Scandinavia were not Vikings. They were the Old Norse, as I said, the inhabitants of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The term Viking, as it was in Old Norse, simply meant one who went somewhere in a ship. 
that that's all it was, be it raiding, trading, exploring, founding new settlements in other lands, just, you know, admiring the lovely scenery as it sailed past on a nice day. You could say it meant, well, it meant a seafarer, a pirate, an adventurer, but going in a ship, you now going in a ship was required. The Old Norse never called themselves Vikings, other than in that very specific um, nautical sense. And even then, they were not Vikings. They were people going Viking or going Viking. Or not, not quite the same thing. And in that context, as, as I said, there was no such thing as a Viking ship. It was just a ship, like the people in it, that was going Viking. Till Father a Viking as it was in Old Norse. The ship was just that, a ship, pure and simple. And re regardless, regardless of the terminology, ask most people what the Vikings were, and of course they'll tell you they were nasty raiders. Oh, they plundered and killed and they burned things. Oh, disgusting, you know. Well, it's a popular image, but you know, it's wrong too. They weren't doing that 24-7, 365 days a year. The only thing they did was spend all their time, you know, sailing around, burning things, and raping any woman who still had a pulse. Well, maybe some of them as well. No, no, that, that is completely wrong. It just ignores the, the extensive trading, the exploring, and the colonization of the Norse people. I mean, they, they were the greatest traders and explorers of their day, in fact, and founding new settlements in many countries that would grow into cities, well, such as here in Ireland, you know, where most of our principal cities were founded by the Norse, not the native Irish, including the capital, Dublin, or Diffin, uh, as they called it. The Vikings, in the correct um, sense of that word, in its popular raiding uh, context at least, were mostly part-time raiders. And they were farmers, carpenters, fishermen, blacksmiths and so on, who went raiding during the summer months when the sea conditions were good. Then they came home and went on with the day jobs, you uh, might say. Very, very few would have been professional raiders, you know, doing nothing but raiding and living entirely from the proceeds of that. Nor was every Viking fully armed and armored, helmet, chainmail, swords and shields, purpose-made battle axes, as though they were they were a military force, which they weren't very very far from it. Few men would have worn a helmet or chainmail, nor carried a sword or a special battle axe. See, those, those things were expensive. Iron was a bit hard to come by uh, at that time up there, and it, it cost a lot to make things like that. And most of the men, well, they would simply have been dressed in their everyday clothes, whatever they happened to be wearing when they got in the ship to go raiding, and that, that is what they would have worn. Their weapons would often have been things they used in their occupations and trades, or used for hunting. You know, wood axes, fish or boar spears, bows, and, and so on. Now, the actual Viking armies, well, they would have been another matter. The, the great heathen army, or the force that attacked Paris in the 9th century, or the forces of Harald Hadrada in, in 1066. Well, yeah, many of those men, they would have been properly armed and equipped. They were the, the house carls, the personal warriors of the various leaders. And, of course, they would be fully equipped and armored because their employers could afford it. They weren't having to shell out for it. They were closer to what we might think of as proper soldiers, something the Viking raiders generally were not. You know, there's a very big difference, there's a very big difference between soldiers and part-time raiders, men who trained constantly for battle and were fully armed and armored, and the carpenter who takes his wood axe and goes off in his everyday clothes to raid a monastery somewhere. There's, there's quite a difference between the two. That's not to say that that man couldn't fight. He could. He could fight very well indeed. He would have been very aggressive and he would have been fierce in, in, in combat. You know, but he would have been at a disadvantage against the house carols with their armor shields and greater military uh, preparedness, uh, you could say. And it must be remembered that not every Norseman would have gone off somewhere in a ship seeking wealth and glory. No, I mean, some men would never have gone to sea. It would probably have been Plenty of men never even seen a ship if they happened to live quite far from the sea and they had no occasion to go anywhere. They were perfectly happy on their farm or whatever and they didn't feel any great sense to go off looking for honor, glory, and well, possibly death to achieve it, which was a slight drawback, of course. The so often overlooked benefits uh, the Norse brought to Europe included international trade, bringing goods 
back from as far away as Constantinople and even Baghdad, and, and taking things like the beautiful metalwork, exotic fur, and amber, which is very hard to find in the Mediterranean, but it, it's plentiful in the far north, and bringing those to those places. They contributed to speak. You know, I mean, over 50 words in English are actually from Old Norse, and that includes egg, cake, anger, get, fog, bylaw, gelding, geyser, husband, kid, knife, blunder, ransack, and sky. I mean, they, they, it just goes on and on in that case. They, they brought considerable skills uh, to other lands, such as improved and unequaled uh, shipbuilding, it has to be said. Superb construction methods, including buildings held together without nails, just the pressure of wood, wood against wood. And lands such as Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Normandy owe their development to the North. But, but in the eyes of so many people, all they did, you know, all they did was raiding, looting, burning, and raping, a lot of raping, you know, the most brutal savages of early medieval Europe, oh, the brutality of it. But even the brutality isn't strictly correct. No, it really isn't. Yes, yes, Viking raiders were brutal. Well, there's never been a nice, pleasant, friendly raid in history, you know, no matter who did it. I mean, can you imagine? I say, Anglo-Saxon chap, we would like to raid your village, take your worldly goods, and take your women if that's not too much trouble. Why, of course, old chap. Always like to meet people from other places, show them a friendly smile, you know, and all that sort of thing. Go ahead, help yourself. What sours is yours, you know? But, but our women aren't really very much to look at, you know. Not that long way. Actually, they've been doing us a favor. We've been trying to get rid of them for years. <laughs> that is no problem. All cats look the same in the dark. We thank you. It is a great pleasure to raid you. Any time, old chap. Do, do drop in. Any time to pass it, won't you? Uh, maybe stay for a cup of tea next time. What? Oh. No, it never happened like that. And even before the Vikings arrived, the Anglo-Saxons, well, I mean, they were raiding each other, and the Welsh and the Scottish tribes were raiding them. And in Ireland, various petty kings and chieftains were happily raiding each other and doing all the things that went along with it, you know, the burning and the raping and all that stuff. The famous cattle raid of Cooley uh, here in Ireland comes to mind. All these raids involved extreme violence, murder, and... Well, as I said, frequently rape, very frequently that. And while the Vikings did it with more style, you know, leaping off dragon-headed ships, oh God, that's so romantic, you know, the sudden appearance by sea giving no time to prepare a defense, well, their actual brutality was really very little different from anybody else. You know, brutality is brutality. Of course, they were pagans, oh yes, they were pagans, oh. And those they raided were not, so of course they were automatically evil servants of the devil in the eyes of the church. And it was mostly priests and monks who wrote the chronicles of the time. So the Vikings got what today we call a bad press. And it was really a very bad press. Now, with a bit of fake news uh, thrown in for good measure. You know, if a monk sat down amid the smoldering remains of his monastery to add something to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, I mean, it was rather unlikely that he would have tried to give a fair, impartial, and unbiased assessment of the Viking raiders who had just gone on with, uh, just gone off with the monastery's gold and silver and some of his fellow monks as slaves. A bit like asking a sheep to give an unbiased account of a wolf pack. Well, you know how that would go. Continuing with the church theme, you know, the Vikings hated Christianity. Oh, everybody knows that. You know, wanting to drive it from the face of the earth, get rid of all those Christians. Well, again, knowing does not make it so. That's wrong, too. The Norse the Norse really didn't give a, uh, give a hoot about uh, what other people believed in. And early Christian missionaries to Scandinavia were generally either treated with polite indifference or, or simply ignored. We are frequently told that the Vikings hated Christianity because, well, they, they pillaged and burned churches and, and monastic institutions. Yeah, I mean, it's so obvious, isn't it? Well, yes, they did. And 
you know, that holds pride of place in popular belief. It has nothing to do with religious bigotry. It had everything to do with profit, obtaining valuable goods, and in those times, churches were the best place to find that. Most of the wealth was in the hands of the clergy. You know, many bishops were far wealthier than the thanes and the kings they served. Churches were filled with gold and silver objects of all kinds, bejeweled vestments, monetary offerings from the faithful. And, of course, monks and priests were among the very few people who were able to read and write in those days, making them valuable for sale as slaves. You know, and churches were very, very soft targets, as we'd say today, defended by priests and monks whose idea of resisting attacks was to pray at the attackers. Oh, Lord, please stop this nasty pagan from hitting me with the axe that he is raising at this moment in his hand to bring it down upon my skull. That's a very ineffective form of defense, it must be said. If Jews and Muslims had had the wealth of those times, well, Viking raiders would have walked right past Christian churches and they would have pillaged synagogues and mosques. And, of course, today we would be told, equally incorrectly, that they hated Judaism and they, they hated Islam and they wanted to drive those faiths off the map. And, you know, the Vikings are often portrayed as very scruffy, unkept and decidedly unattractive. Yes, really, yeah, you know, the, the recent movie The Northman, uh, for example, had a lot of very scruffy, rather not very tasty people wandering around in it, which is the exact opposite of what they really were. I mean, probably the cleanest people in Europe at that time. Washing their hands and faces every day, combing and grooming their hair, changing their clothes regularly, and bathing once a week. The day that we call Saturday was a lot of good, uh, the bath or pool day. You know, bathing once a week. Uh, combs and earwax uh, removing tools are frequently found in Norse graves. Their cleanliness, well, that absolutely astonished the Anglo Saxons. Well, I mean, they might bathe only once a year or twice if they were real uh, clean uh, freaks. Uh, it is even possible that some people back then were never immersed in water again after their baptism. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, and, uh, why keep taking clothes on and off all the time? You know, that made absolutely no sense to actually put them on. I mean, why go to the trouble of taking them off? It, it, they, 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 they couldn't figure this out. And it annoyed them too. Oh, yes, it really annoyed them. And that may have played a part in the St. Price's Day Massacre. 1002 AD, when King Ethelred the Unready foolishly ordered the killing of Norse people in his kingdom, bringing considerable retaliation down on himself. But, but many Saxons might have been only too glad to participate in the killing because the astonishing cleanliness of the Norsemen was causing them problems with their own women. Oh, yes. The English chronicler John of Wallingford, writing about the event, stated that. The Danes made themselves too acceptable to English women by their elegant manners and their care of their person. They caused much trouble to the natives of the land, for they were wont, after the fashion of their country, to comb their hair every day, to bathe every Saturday, to change their garments often, and set off their persons by many frivolous devices. In this manner they laid siege to the virtue of the married woman and persuaded the daughters, even the nobles, to be their concubines. Well, I mean, you couldn't have that sort of thing going on, now could you? Of course, had the Anglo-Saxon men tried washing occasionally, even monthly, even monthly maybe, putting on clean clothes from time to time, maybe they would have done a bit better at keeping their women faithful. They must have been a bit pongy on a hot day. And you know, houses back then really didn't have windows, not much ventilation apart from a hole in the roof to let the fire smoke out. So being indoors with Saxon men might have got a bit odiferous, if you see what I mean. And that must have reduced the old hanky panky house your father quite a bit. Just a thought. The Norse gods. Now the Norse gods lived in Valhalla and Viking warriors dreamt of going to Valhalla when they died in battle. Everyone knows that. It's mentioned in just about every movie or documentary. It pops up constantly on pagan websites, with some people today even claiming that they will go to Valhalla. 
No, sorry to burst that bubble, you won't, I'm afraid. Firstly, because, well, you know, they're extremely unlikely to die in combat with a sword in their hand. Their sword fights are really rather rare these days. Which was the only way, you see, one of those nice Valkyries would swoop down and take someone up to feast with the gods. But principally, because it's totally wrong. Yes, we're back to the wronger again. The Norse gods do not live there, nor did Vikings think they would go there after a heroic death on the battlefield, mainly due to the fact that there's no such place as Valhalla. It doesn't exist, which would well make it a tad awkward for anyone to live there or go there, or honorably dead or, or otherwise. See, the gods live in Oskarda, meaning the enclosure of the Asia, connected to Midgard, the realm of mortals by the Rainbow Bridge, Bifos. And the dead warriors went to Valhall, meaning the hall of the warriors who died in battle from Val, which meant specifically one who died in combat with a weapon in their hand, and hall meaning a hall. It was one of well, it was one of many halls in Oscar, a very important one. Odin's hall, roofed with shields for the Einherja, the once fighters, where they would feast with him until the great battle that would end the world. Ragnarok should uh, come along. Valhalla did not exist. You know, the word wasn't even used until the 18th century. Though there, there is a, a grammatical usage in Old Norse. It does sound something like it. If you wanted to say you were going to Valhall, you would say till Valhalla. A similar sound, but still not Valhalla, no. I, I find it a bit strange how many people who should know better, really should know better, still say Valhalla. Now, even many historians and experts on the Viking Age use the word rather than correcting the error and calling it Valhall. Well, Richard Wagner pops up again, of course, in that context, with the magnificent ending to Das Rheingold as the gods cross the rainbow bridge into Valhall, oh, as it is in, in German, which is nearer, of course, the correct word, but still wrong. Uh, they are actually entering Moscow. Wrong destination. Have oh, superb music. Yeah, you, you really came up trumps on that one. So, there we leave the Vikings. So often misunderstood, misrepresented, and not quite like so many people imagine them. Their contribution to European history, to language, to culture was immense. And, and their treatment of women, now their treatment of women, was far superior to many others of their day, or even today in some places. Uh, you know, I, I saw a meme I rather liked, and it, it, it went like this. Gender roles have always been strictly defined. We should be like the Vikings. Correct, yes, your wife should control your finances. She should put you on an allowance. She can even divorce you for any reason at all. Uh, what? Mm, you need to braid your beard and wear perfume. Mm, you'd be, really be like the Vikings then, yes. Um, of course, that, that applied to their, their women. Other people's women. Now, other people's women were spoils of war, you could say, and they were fair game for any mistreatment. Whereas Norse women, oh, they were decidedly not. You know, you couldn't even touch a woman without her permission. I think a little bit of Vikingness in that sense could be very uh, useful today, where women are not always treated properly, I'm sorry to say. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and until the next time, I shall say farewell, goodbye for now.